So, hello and welcome to this first session in the Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry days. My name is Jan. I'm working for, for SAP in the Bosch OpenStack CPI team, although we're, we're going to work more on Bosch as well. Um, and we do deploy Cloud Foundry on OpenStack. Um, at least according to, to the survey, we're not the only ones, so it's a prominent workload. Um, like, it was the second most behind Kubernetes. Like, today morning I saw that there might be a newer survey where it is like second place together with OpenShift. But it's a prominent workload. And so interoperability is, is important for, for, all those, for all those users. And what I mean when I say interoperability is like I have a certain workload and I want to run them on different open stacks, be it different versions, different distributions, or even just different configuration. So what is Cloud Foundry? Like from the end user point of view, it's a rather simple cloud application platform. You can just push your code and it's going to be, to be running. From the other perspective, it's a rather complex distributed system with heterogeneous components um, that interact with each other. Um, so this is all managed by Bosch in the case of Cloud Foundry, at least in most deployments. Um, and Bosch is a tool to manage distributed systems in general, like creating the VMs, deploying the software that should be running there, um, creating disks, attaching them to the VMs, um, monitoring VMs and resurrecting them if they are failing. Um, that's all done by Bosch. And Bosch is multi-cloud by default, so it, it has a cloud provider interface, which there are many implementations of. One of them is the, the Bosch um, OpenStack CPI, and that's exactly what I'm working on with my team. So as a short wrap up of what I'm going to talk about, interoperability is hard, it's tough. Not only providing it, but also verifying that things are as you expect them. And what we see from the OpenStack community, like the DEF core recommendations, ref stack, is just not enough. Like, I mean, OpenStack powered platform is far from being, you can run Cloud Foundry there, really, really far. And that's why we came up with the Cloud Foundry OpenStack Validator, which is a CF-specific interoperability test suite um, that tries to use the OpenStack in question just as Bosch and the CPI and Cloud Foundry would. So we create VMs with the CPI, do all that lifecycle stuff, attaching disks, detaching them, taking snapshots, all these operations. In addition, we, th there are some more requirements like um, um, the interconnectivity between VMs, and it's easy to extend. So if you have um, a an, an Cloud Foundry product that is based on open source Cloud Foundry, you can, you can write extensions for the validator. So you might ask, what's the problem, right? Interoperability, isn't that built into OpenStack? There's DEF core recommendations, ref stack, a test suite that actually, that actually tests these recommendations. But turns out that, at least until recently, I think there was neither Neutron nor Cinder nor Glance were, were actually a recommendation that you needed to get the brand, I'm an OpenStack powered platform. I think that changed recently, so there is a new JSON file in the DEF core repository that actually includes some Neutron stuff and has some Glance and, and Cinder stuff. But uh, yeah, that was not the case until, until recently. The second approach to interoperability that we've seen the first time on the, on the Barcelona summit was the interop challenge, where like 16 people were on stage deploying the same workload to 16 different open stacks. Um, the problem there was it was a rather small web application, so nothing compared to a complex distributed system like Cloud Foundry with special requirements in this era, area. And um, it uses a library, a Python library called Shade, that actually hides all those, inter, um, all those problems, all those incompatibilities and interrupt problems. 
by having a cloud config that tells the library where it has to apply the, the compatibility switches. So it's going to work for exactly 16 OpenStacks. And that's a big problem. I mean, you can use that um, for public clouds, maybe, because then there will be a provider of that. But as soon as you install OpenStack on-premise, who's going to manage these, these configuration files? Um, so in short, 16 people doing the same workload on 16 OpenStacks is a really good, good thing. So don't get me wrong there. This is a step forward for the OpenStack community. But it does by no means imply that I can run my workload on my OpenStack. So basically, if you either deploy Cloud Foundry on OpenStack or provide an OpenStack that should run Cloud Foundry as a workload, that's the question that you want to answer, right? to have answered. Does it run on this OpenStack? Um, the sad reality from, from our point of view, like as the Bosch OpenStack CPI team, we were approached like, here's a new OpenStack. Can we run it there? And from our point of view, the sad reality is there is no interop. There is different versions, different distributions, even different configurations can, can make the things break. So for us, it meant really for each new OpenStack installation, testing that from the ground up, which we did by actually running our uh, continuous integration pipeline against that. So it meant using Terraform to prepare the project with network and keys and stuff like that, then installing Bosch, then installing Concourse, which is our CI system that is deployed with Bosch, and then setting our pipelines and having them run. And most often, we had them fail. So it's a long list of manual steps. Each of them can fail for, a vari for, for various reasons, so for all kinds of reasons. And it's often hard to, to see what is the actual problem and what is a possible fix for that problem. And even if we were done with that, turns out there's this little document on cloudfoundry.org that tells you how it's not meant to be readable on the slide. It's just to show that I think it's 18 pages long, what you have to do to test if, um, if Cloud Foundry runs. So there's things like VMs have to be able to talk to each other. Um, there is like Cloud Foundry needs larger disks than you might have in a CI environment. Things like that are in that document. And it's even worse because that document actually states, well, I can tell you that it's not going to work. But if you've really completed all these steps, yeah, it might work. It might not. You don't really, really know, know that. So who of you successfully installed Cloud Foundry on OpenStack? How, how long did it take? Huh? Ah, OK, yeah. I, I know why. Uh, you, you would say it's because you're not using Bosch. <laughs> anyway, um, what were the ar errors looking like? Were they helpful? No, you usually have to go to the OpenStack logs to check uh, what was going on, really. And, uh, well, in my case, I didn't have a large uh, box list, uh, and I had to do a lot of over subscription to be able to use the Foundry. So many, many problems I had was because of this over subscription I had to. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, th so that's our experience as well. It's like, it's a long process. All of these steps will fail because they can fail. For different reasons, you'll have to really dig deep and then start over again. When you found the problem and solved it, you'll just start over again. Um, so from our sp perspective, we've seen that ref stack and interrupt challenge are just not enough. They are good projects, but they are no guarantee that Cloud Foundry will run. I don't know, maybe they know OpenStack really well, or they chose the right OpenStack installation? So we, we actually have, we have two different teams doing it. So the PCF team, they are separate. They don't interact with the OpenStack team at all. 
Okay. So yeah, I, I don't say that this can't happen, but like it's not our experience. So either you have a brilliant OpenStack team, a brilliant Cloud Foundry team, whatever. Maybe I should state that we are hiring. And, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so our experience is like REST and interop is, is a good thing, but it doesn't work for us to guarantee that Cloud Foundry is going to work. So we came up with this as an alternative, like a small command line application. There's some preparation work you have to do for the for the um, project uh, for the OpenStack. So you need to have a project there, a network, a reserved floating IP, some some stuff, but that's documented. And there is um, a rather small configuration file with about 10 mandatory values. Half of them is like OpenStack credentials, network, IPs, things like that. It's not a lot. And then you can just run it and see if everything is fine. This is like the, the principle that we apply is what I said already in the beginning. We really use the CPI to, um, to interact with OpenStack do the life cycle um, that, that Bosch would normally do. And in addition, um, on, on VMs that we, that we fire up, we do some more sophisticated tests, like can they actually reach each other network-wise um, and things like that. Is like the API write, rate limit is one of the, the checkpoints in the, in, the document, in the documentation, how you check if the OpenStack is ready to run. We have some pre-checks. Um, like that work on the API level as well, like are the security groups set and things like that. Um, testing network connectivity of VMs, like can they reach the internet, all, all kinds of things. But now coming to the more, maybe more interesting point, I mean, seeing that green is really, really cool. We didn't have that often in the first run. So most of the time we had problems. So the question is, if it goes wrong, what went wrong? How can you fix it? Um, and so I brought some, some example outputs um, in case you had problems. So one of the things we need to check is Bosch needs to access VMs via SSH. That's for talking to their, for, for providing Bosch SSH for you so you can SSH into the machines. Um, and then we have actually two, two checks, like a, a, a small pre-check, just checking the security group. So for the easy failure that you just don't have a security group allowing that traffic. But we are then SSHing into a VM and actually trying to reach another VM on, a, on port 22. Doing that with NatCut and in case of failure, just reporting the, the output. This is a bit, a, a bit long. I actually filed a bug on our project for that because SSH unfortunately logs its warning on error, on standard error, so we print it here. We should actually get rid of that because we know what's, what it's going to print. But it's the netcut sad, it says it can't connect to that VM, is the basic thing that you, that you see there. Um, Cloud Foundry VMs have to be able to reach um, the internet, like build packs, need to download stuff from somewhere, so we actually do a stage check, so to say. Like first, we try an NS lookup if DNS actually works. And that's the failure I, I brought with me. Um, so we try to reach DNS with the configured service. And um, if that fails, we provide you with an, with an error. There's another unfortunate bug here. So that's a little bit faked because uh, it's not fixed yet, I guess. Unfortunately, NSLOOKUP logs its error to standard out, so we don't print it. So I, I actually added the last line that says what, what NSLOOKUP has as output. Um, what? Here we have a, a more a harder, even harder one. That's like, you, you can believe that, that distributed systems need to agree upon time. So this is something that go, can go wrong after you successfully deployed Cloud Foundry, because after some time, the system goes out of sync. So that's something we have seen, um, because uh, we need to, to use uh, internal NTP service, because we can't reach out on 53. And so that was one of the problems that we've actually seen, seen live. Um, and this is really a hard one if that goes wrong. Figuring out what went wrong 
a couple of weeks ago, so to say, is a, is a really tough one. So you already th see a theme. I think there's lots of network, network tests. I really hope to bring with me the MTU test, but that's just made it up to the backlog, but it's not implemented yet. So I guess lots of you have seen MTU problems. We're going to write something that is actually trying to, to, to send packages over the network and figure out what the, what the MTU is and figure out if it's according to the configured one. I mean, recommendation for Cloud Foundry is 1,500. You could change that in, 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 the, in the validator YAML if you know what you're doing, because you have to configure lots of Cloud Foundry components. Um, You have to, to actually change OpenStack to, to give you that if you use GRE tunnels or something like that. You have to increase the, the packet side on the outside of the tunnel to actually have 1500 on the VM. Hmm? True, either one is good, but yeah, I, I think I would recommend to actually change the OpenStack to say, like, you never know if there's a component in there where you missed the configuration or that is not configurable or whatever, so I would actually give the, 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 the VMs 1500. But you can change that, and it's not yet implemented. That's like on top of our backlog as one of the next tests that we introduce here, but it's not, not there yet. Um, that's another thing that's from, the, from these 18 pages of documentation. Um, Cloud Foundry needs large disks. One of the typical scenarios where you get an error there is if you try to deploy Cloud Foundry on DevStack, because there you have to change the configuration to really get larger disks. So that's why we, we placed actually that hint there. I think we had two or three bugs actually for, for that. That was, yeah. And then there are other things like the Cloud Controller needs a blob store. You might use Swift for that. And there's a whole lot of things that you can do wrong there. Um, you need to configure an X account meter temp URL key. If you don't do that or use a different one, you'll get a 401 like you see here. Another reason for failure can be that the Swift proxy server is actually not configured to serve the, the URL. That's something else that you can you could do wrong if you use that as, um, as the blob store. Now, our promise is like if the CF OpenStack validator passes, you can expect that Cloud Foundry can be deployed on that OpenStack. If that's not the case, we, I would consider that a bug in the validator. It should actually show you that. And if it doesn't pass, it should give you like output that is like actionable feedback. You should then know what you should change in your OpenStack or what you should do differently um, to make it pass. If that's not the case, open an issue on our project for better error messages or whatever, or things that you, that you found. Or if you, found, if you find an open stack system where the validator doesn't pass, but you can deploy Cloud Foundry successfully, that's just the same. That's all issues on our side. Now, most of the vendors don't really have just open source Cloud Foundry, but have products based on open source Cloud Foundry. So we made the validator extensible. So you can rather easily plug in extensions to test things that are not necessary for open source Cloud Foundry, but maybe for your product. Um, that could be different things. The, um, the Swift Blob Store thing that you've seen is actually an extension because you have the choice of S3 or Swift. So it's an optionable component, an optional component. Um, other things are we're checking for certain flavors to exist and be configured in a, in a certain way, like our product expects it, like we use them in, in, our in our Bosch manifests, so they should be present. We expect certain quotas to be in place, and we have a, an extension, a configurable extension for that. So you actually give it a file, a separate file, like this is the flavors I expect, and this is the course that should be in that flavor, um, or even metadata, like if you need hardware random, randomness, you can specify that there's actually a flavor that should be configured to have hardware randomness um, in place. And we have another extension that checks accessibility of external components. So we have our own enterprise GitHub that we need to reach, and that has to be 
like it's not in the public, so it has to be there has to be some network configuration. So we have a, an extension for that. Um, what we are planning to do is to, to um, cope with non-functional requirements, like performance. Like we are going to check, or I mean, this on, only plan. We're not fixed yet how we are going to do that, but checking things like disk I/O that you get, and that it's according to what you would expect for running your Cloud Foundry, or um, what else is a good a good example? Um, there's there's security recommendations that we're going to place in there. Like if you're using Swift as a blob store, you should probably have a user that is only allowed to use Swift and is not allowed to fire up VMs or shut them down. So uh, th we, we'll probably do that as extensions so that you can act, it, it's a recommendation. If you want to do it differently, then just don't turn on the, on the extension. And you can actually write your own extensions. We provide an API for you, like that you can easily um, call the, the OpenStack APIs via Fog OpenStack, that's the Ruby library that we use, or you could use the CPI to do things and we've um, resource tracking implemented. So every resource, you can add resources to, the, to that tracker. So after the test run, everything is going to be cleaned up. Like VMs that are left in place because, I don't know, the test broke before you shut them down. Um, we are actually going to cope with that. So there are APIs that you can, you can use to easily create um, extensions so, so that you get an answer to, to that question, like is your Cloud Foundry based product running on your customer's OpenStack? Um, so coming closely to a conclusion, um, we, we've seen that RefStack as the least common denominator is not enough for guaranteeing um, that Cloud Foundry runs. Um, interrupt challenge in its current state isn't either. Um, and I've shown you a tool though that we actually use to get an answer to, to the two questions that are, that are there. Like, will Cloud Foundry run on my OpenStack? Will my Cloud Foundry based product run on my OpenStack? Now, is that how interop or interop checks should be? Definitely not. I mean, the way we're doing is like try things out, catch any errors and try to figure out what went wrong and provide usable, usable feedback. So that's definitely not the end of the story. I would rather spend work on Bosch or on Cloud Foundry, other topics, instead of writing this, this validator. That was out of necessity. And there's, a, there's an interesting project in the OpenStack community that's called Oak Tree, which is based on the shade library that I've talked about, like the library that's used for the interop challenges. And their goal is to provide um, a gRPC endpoint um, and in the end something that that actually gets the required capabilities from an open stack so you, sh you could run it just against any open stack that provides its capabilities and so writing a validator like we like we've done would be just checking does it support creating large disks check and all the other things like um, that would not require actual testing because they would cope, like, like the shade library now for 16 open stacks would actually cope with all these interoperability problems. Um, so that's a really interesting project that we are going to follow closely to see what, how, that, how that goes. Because, because of the gRPC approach, we could actually use that, like generate a Ruby client that we can use instead of fog open stack or changing fog open stack to actually use that, whatever, whatever um, would work there. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much for listening. And now I've still some time left for listening to questions that you might have. Um, if you don't get to ask your question, there is my name, my Twitter handle, my GitHub um, handle, and there's the two projects that we actually ma maintain, the, the validator and the OpenStack CPI. So again, thank you. And if you have questions, we have two microphones in the room so that the recording also has the questions.
Hi, I'm a, I'm a newbie in Cloud Foundry myself. I started learning Cloud Foundry a uh, little time ago. Um, I find it very interesting, um, but there is one question I have is that um, I understand that your validator has OpenStack specific commands, right? Yeah. Okay, I was wondering, I mean, I find this, in, this project very interesting, and I wonder if it could be infrastructure ag uh, agnostic, like saying we don't care where we want to deploy Cloud Foundry, we want to, you just want to test that we have the proper infrastructure, just an idea. Um, yeah, I mean, we have tests that actually use the IaaS APIs, so that would have to be like moved out of the core test suite maybe, but we use the same, um, the same interface to the CPI that Bosch uses. So we do shell out to the CPI like Bosch does. So it should be as easy as Bosch can be used against different infrastructures. It's just we have not yet seen the use case for doing that on AWS. So from our perspective, AWS is rather stable. And if Cloud Foundry works there, it's, continued to, it's going to continue to work there. But it could be changed to actually allow different CPIs, yes. Um, as I said, there are some API calls, and there is an API that gives you access to OpenStack, so things would have to change there. Um, and you would probably have to provide the APIs for that specific IS that you're going to target. Any specific IS you had in mind? No, just, just um, when, I, when I was in this, your description, I thought, oh, it would be interesting, for example, maybe not that AWS, because it's just one instance, but maybe for VMware customers, or it should be. It should be possible, yeah. I mean, I'm actually interested in that myself because I've got, got a side project to, to create a Kubernetes CPI, and that would be really interesting to actually check because that's a, a similar situation. So you actually might deploy Kubernetes to somewhere and might have to check if it's configured correctly. So yes, that's a use case. Uh, we have uh, VMware integrated OpenStack separate instance, and we have PCS, PCF separate. And we are planning to have both together. So what, what would be your advice? Like, you know, can we integrate that, or can we have both a separate instance and application stocking? We are, ours is a large distributed applications. So I would like to know, uh, like, we are in a planning stage. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I, I got the question correctly. So, okay, we You've have VMware integrated OpenStack and PCF. Both are running separately, but the applications are talking okay. integrated. So we are thinking about moving PCF into VMware integrated OpenStack to run, on, run over VMware integrated OpenStack. So is it okay. advisable to do that? Um, have you seen any uh, implementations I, like that? I, I, haven't used, I haven't used that. We are mostly running um, SUSE Cloud mm -hmm. Um, so we have a dedicated OpenStack that is not running on VMware, okay. but no, so I don't really have an advice. Hmm? It should be possible, right, if it's, if it's an OpenStack integrated VMware. Yeah, sure, if, you, if you're actually talking OpenStack API, so if you have a VMware that is like playing OpenStack, and you could just run it, the validator, and see if it's green. If not, you hopefully get uh, good errors that help you figuring out what's the problem. If not, as I said, open, it, open an issue, because that's, that would be interesting for us as well, like things that go wrong and um, how to figure out what exactly went wrong. Sure. You're well, very welcome. You, f first, you should reach to one of the microphones, probably, so that this gets recorded. Sorry. Have you run the validator as a diagnostics tool in known working environments that are exhibiting problems to try and 
discover what the underlying issue might be. No, we actually run that um, regularly in our OpenStack environments. Like we have a CI pipeline in all kinds of OpenStack environments. Mm -hmm. They are all running. I mean, they have a dedicated project, and they are, they're actually not spinning up so many VMs that you, that should shouldn't shouldn't be a problem. Oh, okay. So it should be so safe to, to. It should be safe to run that in in a production environment. You mean? Okay. Yeah. To, yeah. We we run that on on an OpenStack where customer things are are running on. Oh. Does Cloud Foundry support uh, native Swift API for Blob Store, or do we have to have any S3 API installed on top of Swift? As far as I remember, Cloud Foundry does support native Swift. Yeah, it does. Uh, because it's, we are the, it's Bosch that doesn't, so you can have an S3 compatible Swift as a Bosch Blob Store. There, you don't have another chance. but. Cloud Foundry does support Swift natively, yeah. Uh, actually, we are installing Pivotal's Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack, and they are saying that they don't support yeah. direct Swift API and Cloud Foundry. Only they say they don't? It. Yeah. The Cloud Controller has actually, yeah, it has an implementation for a Swift Blob Store that is using FOG APIs, so because I don't problem, know what's... Yeah, the problem here is uh, S3 API is a third-party component, and it's not well integrated to the OpenStack Foundation. And uh, there are some support issues regarding installing S3 API on top of uh, Swift. So is there any plan or roadmap that you guys are going to directly support Swift API? I, I guess you have to ask that uh, question to Pivotal, because as far as I know, it's possible to, to use Swift without a compatibility layer. They are saying that the open, I mean, for, for actually, sorry for, for interruption. Actually, for writing that, that test, we checked out the cloud controller code to see what they are actually doing with Swift, and they were using it natively, using FOG APIs. But because as far as I know, Pivotal's Cloud Foundry is completely open source. They don't modify anything, and they are directly using the Boss uh, CPI. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm just asking. I mean, bo bo as I said, if, if that's about the Bosch Blob Store, then that might be right, because Bosch doesn't support Swift natively. But from what I've seen in code, cloud, the cloud controller should really support that. Yeah, it, it could be Bosch uh, Blob cloud. Store. Uh, yeah. Hmm? Yeah, sure. That's like, as far as I know, we actually use, um, I don't know, either S3 directly or an S3 compatible Swift for Bosch, but we do use Swift as a Bob store for our Cloud Foundry. All right, thank you. If there are no further questions, then thank you all again for attending.